Uh, welcome to those who are here for this evening's Think and Drink session. Fred Frederick Douglas Dixon will be our presenter talking about the three assassinations of Martin Luther King. I know of one of them. I'm very interested to hear Fred's explication of the other two. I'm sure they'll be interesting and they will be in other dimensions or come from other dimensions. So Fred is the director of the Black Studies Center on campus, a professor here at UW and a dear friend and colleague. Been working with him this past year on these think and drinks. And it's been a delight and for me as a Canadian lad, new to your, well, sort of new to your country um, in education, uh, learning about all this. So Fred, uh, without further ado, I'll pass it over to you. And I'll, you had asked me to copy something into the chat if I could, and I'll try to go find that, unless you want me to share okay. it on the screen. All right, all right. So welcome everyone, I am. My name is Frederick Douglass Dixon. Only Dixon on payday, but I'm Frederick, Dix, Frederick Douglass all the time. So we are here tonight uh, with the combination of the Black Study Center and WIRE's Think and Drink series. If you haven't, if this is your first time and you haven't had a chance to partake of WIRE's Think and Drink, it's a wide variety of discussions. Lots of time the discussions circle the humanities which is the backdrop for the Think and Drink, the Wire Institute for Humanities Research. And our captain of the ship, or the one that is our leader is Scott Hinkle, Dr. Scott Hinkle from the University of Wyoming. He's not with us tonight, so we hope that he gets well soon. But we wanna be very specific about Wire and the importance of having these conversations. So these conversations are themselves what we call part of a robust narrative that the humanities has to offer, higher education, and let's think about the larger um, community. So when we think of WIRE and we think of Think and Drink, it's this stimulating conversation about many different topics. And tonight, I think it'll be more than apropos to discuss the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. The anniversary was February 5th. Sorry, let me begin. Slow down just a second. This was April 5th, 1968. So right now we had 53 years. And when we think about that, 53 years since the assassination of Dr. King, it becomes very important that we and, and I mean this from a professional sense and what the profession of higher ed owes the larger society is to revisit, reevaluate, critique and analyze the assassination of Dr. King in a way that is, let's say rarely done. So now we'll begin today in that vein to think about it in a way that allows for us to become very attuned to what is needed in this conversation. So with that being said, we're gonna look at it through the lens of something that will be relatively unique tonight. Something that uh, perhaps you haven't had a chance to discuss or even thought about in a critical manner. When we think about one's assassination or the assassination of a person, then we think a lot of times about them in a way that just simply thinks about a physical death. Well, that's not what we'll do tonight. Tonight we will discuss the idea of Dr. Martin Luther King in three forms of an assassination. So it may be a unique way of looking at it. And I think that's one way to begin to what we call extend the mainstream narrative and to begin what we know now as conversations that normally have been parked at the fences of historical discourse or find themselves latent with um, a pacifism that doesn't allow for his character to truly come to form. 
So we'll begin with the words of the great Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. As he said, nothing in the world is more dangerous than sincere ignorance and conscientious stupidity. And I'm sure that some of you all have heard of this particular quote. And he goes on to say at the end of this quote, because this is a contracted version or this is a truncated version. He says, after that, you have a more responsibility to be intelligent. Let's think about the last part of that a more responsibility to be intelligent. We will take that tone tonight. The more responsibility to be intelligent. And we will look at it through that lens. So here's our overview, very ambitious, but we will get through it. We will get through it. So when I think about something that discusses in general, the legacy of Dr. King, I think about how history is constructed more specifically American history, how it's constructed. And at this point, this is a very common quote, but I wanna make sure that we get it so that we can look at it in a way that puts us in a position to be able to evaluate Dr. King in a much more critical manner. History never lies. So-called historians lie all the time. I want for you to feel free to put your comments, your concerns, your questions in the chat. That's how we'll be able to communicate tonight. Scott's working, not Scott, I'm sorry. Ken's working with us tonight. So he'll be the DJ, if you will. And at this point, please feel free to join and participate through the chat. Here's the problem statement. The problem statement is the mainstream historical narrative has and continues to extract power from diluting and erasing the ever increasing radical evolution of the late Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. from the dominant discourse. Think about some of those things that you learned in elementary school, in high school, and even in college. Dr. King was a dreamer. He was a proponent of nonviolence. He was a great man. Uh, well, there's a part of Dr. King that we will get to tonight that deals directly with his ever increasing radical trajectory. So we're gonna look at it through the historical revisionist lens. So when we think about those who rewrite history, there's a process that attempts to rewrite facts, minimize, denies, supplies, and ignores facts. So today we'll look at it through a lens of empiricism, one lens of empiricism. And when we think about what historical revisionism does, it concretizes, solidifies, and upholds American status quo, which is bound in white supremacy and white privilege. And as you look to that picture, yes, I'm making a very strong statement here. The idea of what we know as the, if you will, physical characteristics of Jesus have always been up in the air. But with the power dynamic that goes with creating history, this is the picture that most of us see or something very similar, which is the exact opposite on the other end of the spectrum of what we find in Revelations that says he has hair of wool and feet of burned brass. So we take this in a way to point out the historical rewriting of this particular event. So the central problem is written really well by Tavis Smiley, who writes on this on Dr. King's uh, life, his last year of his life and Death of a King. I think it's a great book that you should look to. A very easy read, but a great read. He says, I've come to firmly believe that in a critical way, he is misunderstood. I believe that misunderstanding is robbing of us of his essence and his character and his crusade. Ironically, his martyrdom has undermined his message. We will get to it. Think about these key words, misunderstanding, the essence of his character and crusade and martyrdom. I use for my methodological approach for this particular historic piece and research, it's a complex case study that allows for us to look at in a contextual, in-depth examination of his assassination. So we can explore key events, those implications and the layered nuance surrounding his assassination. The intellectual lens that I'll use today comes from a tradition, the black scholar activist model created by Robert Christian. And I was introduced to it by Dr. Swinney Adichachu at the University of Illinois Champaign. Has at least four goals. Contribute to knowledge of African-American history, to discuss politics in a much more radical manner, social movement repertoires where we are very critical of social movements, which we will be today. And most of all, challenge the mainstream historical narrative. The role of the researcher 
I am, if you can see where it says background, a second, second generation historian, lifelong Chicago. Today, the research agenda circles around social movements, the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King and the decline of the civil rights movement. One in tune with the other, not separated. Think about it in a social movement context. His assassination and the decline, or let's say ending, of the civil rights movement. Again, I'm a second generation historian. As you see there, you see the Honorable Professor Willie Dixon Jr. And if you look to your immediate right, you see him when he's being honored at the Chicago uh, DuSable Museum, which at one time was the oldest and largest black history museum in the country. So he was the lead historian there for over 30 years. So when I say second generation in the most intimate manner, in the most intimate settings, I was trained to be one who would challenge the mainstream narrative by being empirically correct and up to par. Now I would take a brief history to look through Dr. King's life. As you see his family, you see his mother, his father, his grandmother and his siblings. And this particular quote comes from the autobiography of religious development, which is taken from a handwritten assignment of Dr. King, the only religious class that he took at Morehouse, which I'm understanding he got a C in this class. And you can directly find this, it's called an autobiography of religious development. If you go to Stanford University who has Dr. King's papers, it says, quite easy for me to think of God, think of a God of love, mainly because I grew up in a family where love was central and where lovely relationships were ever present. He's talking about the relationship he had with his parents and his grandparents. So he explains to you that the power of his family goes back to love. But when you think about what he was very close to, there it is, as a father, a mother, and a grandmother, they particularly led the way, set the path, for about what the importance of family and also what the relationship would be like with those who are older than him. What's in a name? Well, let's stop it right there. How many of us know Dr. King's original name? Well, why don't you put it into the chat if you can remember it, but, got, but I'm sure there are a few people, more than a few people online who know this. But to think about what's in a name is to think about symbolically what someone who named you really believed, who thought the influence would be, who thought the influence would become an outcome. And he look at what's his name. Well, he was born Michael L. King Jr. Some say Michael Lewis King Jr. So when we think about how he got that name, he gets this name from his dad who travels to a conference, an international conference in Germany where he begins to become enamored with Martin Luther. So to think about that and set the record straight from the very beginning, well, we need to understand that Martin Luther King Jr. was not his original name, but his father came back from that experience and began to study even more so Martin Luther, the great reformer, took his name and eventually his son, Michael Lewis King Jr. became Martin Luther King Jr. It's very important that we tie daddy's king, as we call him affectionately, daddy king's understanding of what his son would be to the connection to the great reformer. How do you explain that? Very hard to explain, but we can partake from it and understand his father's brilliance. He was a third generation clergyman. So his grandfather, A.D. Williams, his dad, Martin Luther King Sr., and then there's the youngest of the bunch, Martin Luther King Jr. And if you have this kind of backdrop, if you have this kind of experience as part of your DNA that taps into your psychoviscera, then you have this training that comes with rules, expectations, and also what the development would look like. So understand, well, we hear a lot of times that they're not Black men in the household. Martin Luther King was not from that kind of household. He also had a grandfather. So he had this legacy that he was living up to. His academic trajectory, Martin Luther King skipped the freshman year and his senior year in high school. So you won't find a formal graduation or some sort of diploma from Booker T. Washington High School. But 
He goes into Morehouse College at 15 years age. Well, how did that happen? You have to understand the power of Daddy King, Martin Luther King Sr., who was very close to the president, Benjamin Hay, Benjamin Mays at the time, who said if he can send the work, do him. So understand the power of his father and his ability to be a part of Atlanta's educational scene, particularly a middle-class scene of Black people, particularly the clergy. Earned two bachelor's degrees, one from Morehouse, one from Crozier. Became Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. when he earned his PhD, Boston University. While at Crozier, something you may not know, Dr. King develops a serious relationship with a young lady named Betty. Betty is the daughter of a cafeteria worker and a cafeteria worker in herself. So she becomes introduced to Dr. King as he's studying as a student. And what happened? A relationship develops between them. And many write that Dr. King was enamored. Well, let's take a step back and understand Dr. King is living, if you will, from the throes, if you will, of middle-class black background. So to the point that he is changing the trajectory, he's also following an expected trajectory. So this gives him a experience, many experience that people where he lived or where he grew up or those he went to school with did not have. So to understand this as one of those esoteric facts about Dr. King, absolutely. As you can read, one of his uh, classmates said, King never recovered from this relationship and left him a broken man. Well, we have to be able to challenge that. And at this point, I think it's more important to understand than it happened than to understand how, a, how he walk, walked away a broken man. But my understanding was Betty was very adamant about not going back to the South with Dr. King, just something you should know. So when we think about social movements before the civil rights movement, then we need to understand the transatlantic slave trade, reconstruction, which brought us right after Reconstruction, separate but equal, World War I, the New Negro Movement, World War II, and the radical 40s, and the rise of communism all over the country, but particularly in the black community. But one that you gotta look to that, come, that transcends all of these social movements is the American lynching movement. At top, you see a lynching in Marion, Indiana. At the bottom picture, you see the NAACP office in New York, in Harlem. And they left that flag there because every day, as they said, a man was lynched yesterday. So all of these social movements bring us to the civil rights movement. Let's think about four stages of a social movement. Emergence, coalescence, bureaucratization, and decline. Well, let's stop right here. We're looking at three of the major events that constitute the emergence of the civil rights movement, Brown versus Board of Education, 1954, the murder of Emmett Till, 1955, and Rosa Parks and the rise of the Montgomery bus boycott. This is where we are introduced to the 26 year old dynamic young man from Atlanta, but he's in Montgomery. And when we think about how he comes to prominence, this is the seminal event. I'd have you look at a few of those pictures. That's Dr. King in the pulpit. Below his home is bombed. Right to the very bottom right, there is uh, Dr. King with um, Rosa Parks. And at the top, he takes a picture after it's all over. But this idea was a political and social protest against racial segregation, Jim Crow. But more specifically, it was about humanity about reclaiming or setting the pace for what humanity would look like in the 50s. No better group to have taken that task on directly than those from the South, particularly from Alabama. And when we think about what it did, it challenged laws, de jure, laws on the books that were currently tied to separate but equal, 1896, Plessy versus Ferguson. This is what we see as a challenge. So facing the age of a new challenge, and, and, and I'm gonna stop and go slower right here. These things that you see, I will continue to point out. This is a speech that you can get, 1957. 
facing the challenge of a new age on the heels of the victory of the 381 day Montgomery bus boycott. What happens? Dr. King goes from a local hero to a national hero, a young 26 year old, handsome young man who begins to sound very erudite, who begins to organize through the church. And if you understand the rise of the civil rights movement, then you need to understand the role that the church plays. The role of the church plays in a physical sense. It is the mass meeting in place, but what it plays is the organizing center of the black community. What else does it play? It has a role to create leadership. Now let us be very critical about the rise of the civil rights movement. It's very monolithic in its leadership. So there were black men who were formally educated, Christian, conservative. So for most parts, the leadership did not resemble those who were the masses of those who were in the movement. So when we think about this, it is well worth a, a critique to be able to pull those things apart. And in 1957, Dr. King says, little did we know on that night that we were starting a movement that would rise to international proportion, a movement whose lofty echoes would ring in the ears of people of every nation, a movement that would stagger and astound the imagination of the oppressor while leaving a glittering star of hope etched in the midnight skies of the oppressed. Very brilliant writing, even maybe even more of a brilliant orator, but to be able to talk about this in 1957, what the facing the new challenge, the challenge of a new age does, it allows for Dr. King to double down on his tactic of using nonviolent direct action. And he calls on God to be a cosmic companion, but he sets the pace for what the civil rights movement tactically and socially will do in this particular speech, facing the age, facing the challenge of a new age in 1957. So today we're gonna to get into it and talk about the three assassinations of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. We'll look at a character assassination, a physical assassination, and last, the legacy assassination. So let's begin at the beginning, if it's proper. Founded in 1908, Bureau of Investigations, which eventually becomes the FBI, started under Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt, and the Attorney, G Attorney General Charles J. Bonaparte, 1908. So we're gonna look at it through the lens of one intelligence agency, which is a very mighty bureau but we'll look at it and their role in Dr. King's assassination. So there's a picture of young J. Edgar Hoover, first director. By 1935, it is the FBI. He remained a director for 37 years until 1972. One person reigned over this particular powerful entity for that long of a time. Well, let's think about some of his tactics. We'll put them to test. Cointel Pro. Well, the Cointel Pro started in 1956. Stop it right there, which is the rise of Dr. King. Now, here's what we need to really look at. There's no way in the world without a name, meaning Cointel Pro, that the FBI was not paying strict attention and surveilling those who they considered to be troublemakers, those who they considered to be, or those who would be ops, if you will. So when we think about the Cointel Pro, is the formalized, organization within the FBI that became tyrannical towards Dr. Martin Luther King. And one of the things it says the government it was to make a decision and put the law in their own hands for the greater good of the country, which is basically a misnomer for domestic covert action. Influence political choice and social value for those wanted to uh, become part of the body politic, particularly for Dr. King. Neutralize target groups and individuals. And a great number of these groups that they targeted were black. But let's think about the purpose to hinder the political actions of the radical black American population. This is what they write in the Cointel Pro as their central purpose. Now, if you look at the bottom at this um, citing, one thing that you should look at if you're very interested or interested at all in one of the most in-depth investigations into the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King is called the church report. The church report, if you just Google the church report, you'll come up with it. So young man who was a Senator out of Idaho, 
and it's very detailed. It also talks about the Kennedys. So we use this as a backdrop to be able to say that our claims are tied into one way of looking at things and we use empirical evidence. One of the goals to prevent the coalition of a black, militant black group nationalists, there is unity in strength. So think about it like that. This is their goals, prevent the coalition of militant black nationalist groups. That was the first goal. We're gonna to go to number two last. So we go to number three, prevent violence on the part of black nationalist groups who were fighting themselves the violence that was done to them by the ruling regime. Pinpoint potential drug troublemakers and neutralize them. So Webster's dictionary talks about neutralize in a transitive form as a verb to chemically neutralize, to counteract the activity or effect of, make ineffective, propaganda that is difficult to neutralize. How about the last, to kill and destroy? A final goal, this is number five, should be to prevent the long range growth of militant black organizations, especially among youth. I want you to go to that part, especially among youth and understand why there has continuously been an assault on the young black male. Well, it was the counterintelligence group, especially among youth, that's why. This has been decided by the higher ups, if you will, those in the catacombs of the esoteric parts of the government that said, especially black youth. More specifically, by that time, when we look at some of the things that craft our social atmosphere and culture, the young black male. Number two. Now, this is verbatim, and all of them have been verbatim in front of you, but this one is the most prevalent. Pre prevent the rise of a black messiah who could unify and electrify the black militant national movement. And this is what is written. Malcolm X might have been such a messiah. He's a martyr of the movement today. What does that mean? This is after Malcolm has been assassinated. Martin Luther King, Stokely Carmichael, and the Honorable Elijah Muhammad all aspire to this position. Here's what's written in the goals. King could be a very real contender for this position should he abandon his so-called so obedience to white liberal doctrines, nonviolence, and embrace black nationalism. Please look at the bottom line. So what they're saying at this point in 1956, as long as King is nonviolent and obedient to liberal white doctrines, then we'll allow him to be the leader of blacks in America and beyond. But I, this will come back. The idea of him and the lack of obedience, or what one would say is ever increasing radicalism. Character assassination, he's a labeled a communist during the height, if you will, during the, pow the most powerful part of McCarthyism. Now, many of us understand that Senator McCarthy, many of us understand what that was about. But for those who don't understand, you could just, even if you were just labeled by McCarthy and his group, to be a communist, then at that point, it was an assassination to your character. And I want you to look. This is a sign found on the side of a road that says that Dr. King is a communist in a communist training school. And when we think about what Dr. King says about communism, communism and Christianity are fundamentally incompatible. So this goes against his religion, this social movement, this social thought, this social theory, Here's McCarthy with the Kennedys. And we don't hear much about RFK until the McCarthy era, where he comes out as his watchdog and he begets this reputation as being this very astute, but a dynamic lawyer. So this is where we first see Robert Kennedy. And if we understand that eventually Kennedy and King will be linked forever, a couple of things come up very quickly. 1962, as the Attorney General, he signs the wire acts that literally allow, meaning as a private citizen, literally allow Dr. King and Malcolm X to be surveilled. And from the orders of Hoover at the very bottom, said King was a communist dupe and a moral degenerate. Character assassination. But here's the thing, very interesting, that J. Edgar Hoover used that same wiretap on both of the Kennedys and the Kennedy family. So to think about that is not to understand clearly the power of J. Edgar Hoover, which we must put into this equation. 
character assassination coming from a memorandum from William Sullivan, who was the head under J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI with the COINTELPRO, the FBI has acknowledged 16 occasions on which microphones were hidden in Dr. King's hotel, motel, an attempt to obtain information about private activities of King and his advisors to, advisors to use to completely discredit them. This is the United States government for those who really don't believe that there's surveillance now of different entities, particularly Black Lives Matter. Dr. King on two of his most famous days, those well earned, the March on Washington, as well as winning the Nobel Peace Prize and being the first black man to receive that award, the youngest at the time in St. Paul's Cathedral. What does Mr. Sullivan, the chief say? We must mark him now if we have not done so before as the most dangerous Negro of the future of this nation and tie him to communism, character assassination. So here's where it's put into practice. Steps were taken to attempt to convince those black churches to leave Dr. King, persuade Negro leaders to completely isolate Dr. King. And even as large and as high as up to the Pope, telling the Pope not to allow Dr. King to have a voice, to have a chance to have a conversation. Here's one of the most fundamentally sound ways of looking at the FBI's approach to Dr. King. This is a letter written to him that calls for him to commit suicide because they so-called had surveillance tapes that they sent to dear Coretta with Dr. King in extramarital affairs. And it says, you have been on the record, all your adulterous acts, your sexual orgies, extending far into the past, the public will know that you, what you are, an evil, abnormal beast. I repeat to you, you are done. And it calls for him to commit suicide. This is the United States government. So the presidential responses, meaning not, more, not one, but we talked about the role of JFK. How about his successor? In light of what those officials did know about FBI's conduct toward Dr. King, and you think about it, says the Bureau to the extent that they neglect permitted the Bureau's activities. So this goes all the way up to LBJ. <clears throat> and Hoover says the depth of directors Hoover's bitterness towards Dr. King and bitterness which he had effectively communicated to his subordinates in the FBI was apparent from the FBI's attempt to sully Dr. King's reputation long after his death. That takes us directly to his physical assassination. Now, as you see this, you see this is Atlanta and you see this is 1968. If I got it correct, it's April 9th. But what happened here is <clears throat> you see Dr. King, his casket is being pulled by a mule. The mule in itself has a backdrop, the mule trail that talks about Marks, Mississippi. Marks, Mississippi was the space where during the Black Power Summer of 1966, a young man died of a heart attack in one of the marches. And they asked Dr. King to come and eulogize him. And when Dr. King got to Marks, Mississippi, it was so poor that he cried, no running water in some spaces. And still mules being written by citizens in 1966. So what did he say? When I go, Make sure I'm carried by mules, something you might not know. The agencies that surveil Dr. King, look at the list. Look at the list. Department of Defense, State Department, Information Agency, Internal Revenue Service, Intelligence Division, Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, U.S. Military. And let's pay attention to the military, the Memphis police and their role. So Dr. King had moved from being a national figure in pursuit of humanity for all by concentrating his last years on the Poor People's Campaign. Poor People's Campaign moved him from civil rights to human rights, moved him from blacks to all who were poor, which was indeed a threat to LBJ and the rest of the country. So many folks said that he had gone too far. He had outstepped his boundaries. He had become a part of a international conversation that he had no place. So let's think about it this way. 
Dr. King is ever increasing and becoming more radical. But go back to that last point. And number two, when we think about the Cointel's prose objective, as long as he remains obedient. The Riverside speech. This is what many call the beginning of the end of Dr. King. And you can read that particular quote. But the Riverside speech, I want you to look at the date, April 4th, 1967, one year to the day of his assassination. Many folks may believe that might be coincidental. I just don't happen to believe that. The Riverside speech in itself, many say was his most poignant speech. I don't agree with that either. But I do agree with the idea of Dr. King using himself as an example when he says it comes a, a time comes when silence is betrayal. He's speaking of himself. Some of us who already begun to break the silence have taken on a, a vocation of agony, but we must speak. Over the past two years, I have moved to break my own betrayal. Dr. King comes out against the war in Vietnam and puts it up front that he had be betrayal with his silence about the war in Vietnam that he called the abominable war, but he broke his silence on this day. What did that do to him? Well, lastly, he said, the greatest purveyor of violence in the world was the United States government. And the Time Magazine called him a demagogic slander. Sounded like a script. Washington Post declared that King had diminished his usefulness to his cause, his country, his people. If you don't believe that the media was being controlled by the United States government and those intelligent agencies, then we need to stop right there because it's happening right now. How many of you all watch CNN? How many of you all watch Fox? Do you think that's the beginning of the slander that comes from the so-called press? Just imagine being Dr. King. The Riverside speech. We were taking the black young men who had been crippled by our society and sending them 8,000 miles away to guarantee liberties in Southeast Asia, which they had not found in Southwest Georgia or East Harlem. Very direct. So this takes us to Dr. King in 1968, February 1st, 1968, while he's working on, never forget this, the Poor People's Campaign. He begins to find out this uproar that's going on in Memphis. So one of the things that comes out of it is that two black sanitation workers lost their lives. And if you look at the top, when the truck's compactor accidentally triggered. That's the mainstream depiction. This is a different depiction on that same day. Look at the very bottom. Both men were crushed to death in a garbage compactor where they were taking shelter from the rain because their white sanitation workers would not let them sit in the truck. So in many ways, Dr. King becomes involved in the sanitation work st worker strike in Memphis because two men lost their lives. So it brings him back into the fray, if you will, pulls him back into the limelight while black power is rising around him. And he looks at Memphis as this particular incident. And if you look to the pictures that we've provided for you, if you've never seen those pictures, I am a man. These are the black sanitation workers. Now, who else would Dr. King advocate for than those at the bottom, if you will? of the trajectory, those at the bottom. And he begins to pay attention to what's going on and inverts and injects himself right into the fray. Thinking about that in a physical sense, make sure that we have a clear history that during the Montgomery bus boycott, Dr. King's home was bombed. And if you look at the date, December 1st, 1955, when Rosa Parks was arrested and January 30th, 1956, very shortly after the 381 day movement started, his house is bombed. So his life is in danger from the very beginning that we see him as a leader. This may be somewhat esoteric, but I need to take a breath and say, please feel free to put into the chat your questions and your comments. Now thinking about Isola, Isola Curry, if you haven't heard of Isola Curry, she was a domestic from New York who stabbed Dr. King in his chest. Look at the middle picture. Stabbed Dr. King in his chest, September 20th, 1958. So close 
to his aorta. And if you understand what the aorta is, that is the organ that pushes the blood from the heart to all parts of the body. And Dr. King wrote, he says, he had a young lady who wrote him and said, Dr. King, we're so glad that you did not sneeze. Because Dr. King said, if he had sneezed, he would have lost his life. So he has a speech. And I'm sure that if you just use the term or use the catchphrase, if I had sneezed, MLK, you'll come up with that. But understand, this was a Black domestic who had the notion that Dr. King was so bad for America that she would take the time. She would take it into her own hands to assassinate him. So living under fear is nothing new for Dr. King. Dr. King and, and those who are in his inner circle, the person that you see here, when you think about it, his name is Ernest Withers. Ernest Withers was the cameraman who had this access like no one else to the civil rights movement. Even up until the day Dr. King is killed, this man from Memphis, who was at one time a policeman, who became a policeman that was disgraced, that we find was a paid secret informant of the FBI. So Dr. King's closest circle, those who are taking these iconic pictures of Dr. King that you see everywhere, those, this particular man who was at one time a police officer. And we're gonna think about the idea of the way that we look at the Memphis Police Department overarching. He went by the code name ME338-R. That was Ernest Withers. So many people have written about it, but when we think about how close the FBI had gotten to Dr. King, that's something we should never forget. April 3rd, 1968. This is the day before Dr. King is assassinated. Well, one thing you gotta understand that Dr. King made a speech March 18th to show his support. And he came back March 28th for a rally and a march. But this march was interrupted by young black men who were, if you will, paid by the FBI to make sure that this would be a violent event and not a nonviolent event, event with, which was Dr. King's MO. So between the 28th of March and the 3rd of April, we see Dr. King on his way back to Memphis to be able to prove to the country that he can and continually, as a weapon, use nonviolence. So we see Dr. King here on April 3rd. Very interesting day, April 3rd. And I think this is more than apropos that we show this. All we say to America is be true to what you said on paper. <laughs> If I lived in China or even Russia or any totalitarian country, maybe I could understand some of these illegal injunctions. Maybe I could understand the denial of certain basic First Amendment privileges because they haven't committed themselves to that over there. But somewhere I read of the freedom of assembly somewhere I read, of the freedom of speech, somewhere I read, of the freedom of press, somewhere I read, the greatness of America is the right to protest for right. And so just as I say, we aren't going to let any dogs or water hoses turn us around, we aren't going to let any injunction turn us around. Well, I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead. But it really doesn't matter with me now. Because I've been to the mountaintop. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place.
But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over. And I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you. But I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. So I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Very interesting. When we think about Dr. King, and we think about what the last speech was like. Very radical. Coming to terms with his own mortality and facing it without fear. And when we think about that being his last speech, how apropos. Prelude. So to think about Dr. King moving back to Memphis for this particular march. Let's dissect it a little bit more. Think about the Lorraine Motel. Well, let's tie the Memphis Police Department to Walter Bailey, owner of the Memphis Motel, connected as a Memphis Police Department confidential informant. On the assassination date, his wife, Lorraine, who the hotel was named after, suffered a heart attack and a stroke and died very soon after. But understand the connection to the hotel owner and understand the connection to Memphis police. April 4th, 1968, last day of his life, Dr. King spends most of his time with those closest to him. Andrew Young was out attempting to get the injunction overturned so they could march. So he wasn't there most of the day. Abernathy, his best friend was there. But the idea of that night at 6 p.m. was to go to Reverend Samuel, Billy Kyle's home for dinner. We'll discuss that. King's Inner Circle and the FBI. According to author Oli Demogar, it was reported that Jesse Jackson, if you've ever heard of Jesse Jackson, you see him at the bottom as a presidential candidate, was the man who came to the Lorraine Motel and said, move Dr. King's room from the ground floor to the second floor, which is 206 to 306. Now, why did he do that? Well, we'll discuss Dr. Uh, Reverend Jesse Jackson later. But understand, they have moved Dr. King's room from the ground floor to the second floor. Reverend Billy Kyles, who was the person they were going to have dinner with, found out that he did not work for the FBI, but he did work for the Memphis Police Department. He gave orders to remove Dr. King's Memphis police security that day. Reverend Billy Kyles, you will hear from him in a way that I think that no one has heard from him, particularly those who are with us now. And if you have heard of him this way, the majority of you all will see it in a different light. Memphis Firehouse Station number two, only a block or so away. The firefighter, as far as the House Select Committee on Assassinations report on Dr. Martin Luther King will allow, uses the name Frank C. And Frank C says that prior to, one hour prior to the assassination, that his firehouse was visited by groups from the military intelligence, the 111, the 209, the 814, the Rangers, and they arrived and they wanted to go up on the roof. And they did go up on the roof. And he says, Frank C, that he heard the shot and they were still on the roof. And it came out in the 1999 uh, case uh, from Coretta Scott to Lloyd Giles that they were up there when the shot took place and they said they were there for backup. The question is what kind of backup? Were they backing up the security of Dr. King that was already removed from him? Or were they backing up the shooter to make sure the job was done? Really interesting, Ed Reddy, one of the two Memphis police officers, black police officers who had taken it amongst themselves to secure Dr. King on more than one occasion were pulled from that post that day, which was firehouse number two. 
He refused and was sent home. But the idea was they said there was a hit out on his life, but he refused to go home. So they took him home and made him stay there. These are actual events, empirical thoughts. FBI, friendlies not wearing ties. You'll see one person there that's not wearing a tie, that's Jesse Jackson. You also see Ralph Abernathy with a tie on. You see Dr. King with a tie on, a very bewildered face. And Hosea Williams to the far right, far left, excuse me. April 4th, right around 6 p.m. After being committed to having dinner at Reverend Kyle's home. This may make sense to some of you all. It was a well-known fact that Reverend Kyle's wife couldn't cook. They joked about her cooking all the time. But the appointment or the dinner was originally set at seven o'clock, but Reverend Kyle's moves it up to 6 p.m. You may think that's a, a very minor detail. Well, I beg to differ. Look at it now, the difference between 6 p.m. and 7 p.m. when you think of light and the light that's left during the daylight, a big difference. So those who were in the Lorraine Motel parking lot, Solomon Jones, who was Dr. King's chauffeur, who eventually is found out to be an FBI informant. So as Dr. King is traveling, he's being recorded. Reverend Jesse Jackson, Dr. Ralph Abernathy, Reverend Billy Cows, and the musician Ben Branch. Ben Branch becomes very important because Dr. King was having words with him and having a conversation about what song he wanted him to play for him. Precious Lord is what he said. And when we think about 6 p.m., like right around a quarter to 6 p.m., bang, shot rings out. Now let's dissect this picture. 6 p.m., do you see the cart to your very right? Now, most rooms are cleaned up by that time. So to those who have studied this dearly, they said this was a pit, this was a, a setup. This was a prop that was used to get Dr. King out on the balcony. But when Dr. King steps out on the balcony, he has a cigarette in his hand, and he is talking to Ben Branch and Jesse Jackson. And Martin Luther King is having an argument well, some words with Reverend Jesse Jackson Jr. about him not wearing a tie. So he says, well, you know, Doc, I don't need a tie, I have an appetite. So that leaves Dr. King, Ralph Abernathy, and Billy Kyles on the balcony, those three. Solomon Jones from downstairs, an FBI informant says, it's cold out here, Doc, you better go get your coat. Ralph Abernathy, Dr. King's closest confidant, leaves the scene and goes to get Dr. King's coat. That leaves Dr. King and Billy Cows. Now here's the venue that you see from the other vantage point. Look to your left in the black and white picture. That's the actual scene. The one to your right is the more modern scene that is part of the National Civil Rights Museum. But I want you to pay attention to those bushes. Those bushes. Now, it was said that the shot came from the flap house, which would be up to the corner to the right as far as you can go. That's where supposedly James Earl Ray took the shot. But there are bushes right there that come into play. Those bushes from the most part, many folks have said, is where the shot took place itself. But how about this, the night after Dr. King is killed, those bushes were torn down by the recreation department. I want you to pay attention. When you see this young man who is directly over Dr. King, please remember this name, write it down if you must. But the young man who has his hand on Dr. King is named Merle McCullough. Merle McCullough was a Memphis, op Memphis police operative who eventually became a CIA agent. So Merle McCullough, the one who's attempting to tend to Dr. King was himself an FBI informant. So the lone gunman theory, James Earl Ray, petty thief, his handler for the FBI, Raul, who was a gun traveler, a gun salesman, one who had special connections to the FBI and could produce weapons. But did you know that 
James Earl Ray escaped from Missouri Penitentiary in 1967. According to author William Peffers, the government, the FBI profiled James Earl effectively a year before that and organized his escape. And do you see this clip? That's from a 1999 interview that he gave. So I'll make this available, but I want you to be able to look at this 1999 interview. Paul Butler, yellow cab company driver, a black man from the Lorraine Motel, was on the scene, heard the shot as he was putting baggage in the car. And who did he see? Memphis police officer Earl Clark, a sharpshooter. Solomon Jones, Dr. King's chauffeur, saw Mr. Earl Clark, the policeman, jump out of the bushes, pull down a white handkerchief, and jump into a police cruiser. Lloyd Jowers. I don't know if you know who Lloyd Jowers is, but he owned the grill that was part of the flop house. In 1993, he said his role on ABC News said they were paid $100,000 to get rid of the rifle. His job was well done. He got it from Earl Clark. But Lloyd Giles had a 16-year-old Black girlfriend who worked as a, waiter, a waitress in his diner. Her name was Betty Jean Spates, who said that she saw him shaking half to death with the rifle. And his common-law wife, Gracie Walton, kept saying that James Earl Ray did not pull the trigger. She eventually was put into an insane asylum and never released. But she never went back on her word. Now, I would have you do your best to pay attention. This is something that I think the majority of you all have not seen. But I want you to pay attention to it. This is Reverend Billy Cowles, 20 years later, in a commemoration in 1968. The last hour of Dr. King's life, hurry, but that gave me the wonderful privilege of spending the last hour on earth. Three preachers in a room, Abernathy, King, and Cowles. And we spent that last hour together in room 306 at the Lorraine Motel. The press is always curious and writers, what went on? What did you talk about? I say, we just talk preacher talk. What preachers talk about when they get together? Yo, hey, the really and all what the you life. fixing to hear now? About a quarter of six, we walked on the balcony, and he was talking to people in the courtyard. He stood here, and I stood there. Only as I moved away, so we could have a clear shot. The shot. And he was talking to people in the courtyard. He stood here, and I stood there. Only as I moved away, so we could have a clear shot. The shot rang out. Thank you. Here and I stood there. Only as I moved away, so we could have a clear shot. The shot rang out. Thank you. Here and I stood there. Only as I moved away, so we could have a clear shot. The shot rang out. Thank you. Turn around and then back on the balcony. The last hour of Dr. So before we go into the legacy assassination, I'm wondering what you heard. I played it multiple times, but I'm wondering what you heard. The only person who was on the balcony when Dr. King gets shot says, he was standing here, I was standing there. Only after I moved away so he could have a clear shot, then the shot rang out. I'm explaining to you what you heard if you didn't hear that. He says, only after I moved out of the way so he could have a clear shot, the shot rang out. So that's more than admitting his role. That is in itself was used in a deposition with the King family against Lloyd Jowers. So please put your comments your concerns, your questions about what Reverend Kyle said into the chat as we go to his legacy assassination. Well, let's think about what a legacy does. Well, they have reduced Dr. King to a slogan, which permits a false narrative to direct the mainstream narrative. Further, America's history status quo goes back to the term that we used at the beginning, history never lies but so-called historians lie all the time. Think about Dr. King's legacy. And we think about his ever increasing radicalism. I think it's more than apropos that we listen to his words. I have a dream. 
little children who one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. I must confess that uh, that dream that I had that day has at many points turned into a nightmare. Now, I'm not one to lose hope. I keep on hoping. Uh, I still have faith in the future. But I've had to analyze many things over the last few years, and I would say over the last few months. I've gone through a lot of soul searching and agonizing moments. And I've come to see that uh, we have uh, many more difficult days ahead. And some of the old optimism was a little superficial. And now it must be tempered with a solid realism. And I think the realistic fact is that we still have a long, long way to go and that we are involved in a war on Asian soil, uh, which if not checked and stopped, can poison the very soul of our nation. I'm not going to say that all of our problems will be solved if the war in Vietnam is ended, but I do say that the war makes it infinitely more difficult to deal with these problems. Uh, when a nation becomes obsessed with the guns of war, uh, it loses its social perspective and programs of social uplift suffer. This is just a, a fact of history so that I have a dream. So if you're listening to Dr. King at this point, that's nine months before his death, he's ever becoming ever radical in his public view. And what we've known him for says what? He said, the dream was a nightmare. So if you've never heard that before, then you have to think that what you've been taught at, bet, at best is finite and does not connect to an infinite understanding of Dr. King. So how does he go about this transformation where Dr. King goes from the most hated man on the planet because he discussed and he chastised LBJ and the rest of America for the war in Vietnam as much hated as he was into what we know him today? Well, they say many Northern, for example, don't understand or believe that Dr. King was a beloved figure. That same year, the Civil Rights Act passed, 1964, showed that the majority of white New Yorkers thought that the Civil Rights Movement had gone too far. Another poll in 1966, just two years before his assassination, 28% of white Americans had a favorable opinion of Dr. King. Separate polls said that 78% of Blacks thought he was doing excellent. So how does he go from a, a villain to a hero today? Well, one specific event, Ronald Reagan, after his first term in office that he agreed with J. Edgar Hoover that King was a communist, changed his tune because he wanted to close the sensitivity gap. Or is it his martyrdom, meaning that his physical assassination allows for a legacy assassination, which I agree with. Said, I'm sure that you have noticed during this work that Dr. Martin Luther King is lionized. There are streets named after him in every city. In every city you go, up until gentrification, those cities and those streets were housed in the poorest people's communities. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Holiday, maybe that had something to do with it. But never forget that the great American, the senator from Arizona, John McCain voted down three times. He said that was the worst feeling that he ever had. Is that true? So by 1999, King comes in second to only Mother Teresa as a beloved figure. So what's his state? Well, with the current narrative, and you see that picture of MLK Dio, Days of Dialogue, that's here at the University of Wyoming. And I believe that they are, particularly when we tie this lecture into what happens on campus, the most tangible group that has taken it upon themselves to march out, roll out, have control over the narrative of Dr. Martin Luther King. And what does it do? Permits nefarious myths to control Dr. King's legacy. Lessens the gravity of the impact of the social rights movement, civil rights movement on America's social atmosphere. Marginalized Dr. King to a dreamer, not a visionary. Provides pathways to systemically 
ignore America's national political and moral peril that we see rising now, sanitizes the clandestine intelligence agency roles in his assassination. And it also whitewashes the hypocrisy of white liberals that allow for Dr. King to only be a dreamer. And that's the problem with MLK DOD. The problem is very obvious. And I'm not saying this from an outsider. I was at once on that committee. And when I knew that that group was married to continuing the miseducation of the masses of folks through the way that they forwarded their programmatic endeavors about Dr. King. Just imagine that. Now this may sound harsh, but this is the way to have conversations that are outside of the mainstream narrative. They are guilty. They are guilty of continuing the miseducation of Dr. King from the top to the bottom. Everyone involved continue, and I saw it for myself, agreed upon not discussing Dr. King, but hitching their own wagons to Dr. King's legacy. And for that, the mainstream narrative suffers. And for that, for those who pull those reins and for those who hold the purse straps, you will suffer because it's wrong and it's a lie. The epilogue, if you understand what happened to the family, Look to the immediate right. A.D., his brother, dies a suspicious death in a swimming pool who was known as an avid swimmer. To the far left, his mother, Miss Alberta King, was shot in Ebenezer Baptist Church by Marcus Chenault during service. And in the middle, right now to this day, they said there is a lot of animosity amongst the siblings. And at the bottom, out of all of this epilogue came an opportunity for four young men, excuse me, five young men from the University of Wyoming to present their research at the National Council on Black Studies in Atlanta 2020, and they did an excellent job. All five of them just happened to be football players, but scholars, number one. And you see us right there in front of Dr. King's home, childhood home. So what you see in the epilogue is what happened to that family how that family was torn apart limb from limb, and how these young men were able to understand that by going to present their research. So that about concludes my portion of this part, but I would like to, if we could, go to the questions that we have in the chat. What you got for me there, Ken? Well, I would just like to start by saying, Frederick Douglas Dixon, my dear friend and colleague, you have blown my mind and blown open my heart. This was an amazing presentation. I'll let you look into the questions in the chat and answer them as you will. I'll take an eye on them as well. And if any of them get missed, I'll pass them on to you. Bless you, my friend. Well, <laughs> I thank you, sir. I, I thank you. I have a, I'm in the Q&A. Uh, Take a look. Q&A, right? Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. I'm here and I see that there is Dr. Julian Williams, a very dear friend and a brilliant <clears throat> mind. What do you think can be done to counter out the cultural death of Dr. King that cast him as simply a dreamer? Well, it's going to take some restructuring, Dr. J, as you know. It's going to take some folks who have the ability, we meaning those in position of power, to take this on as something that is as important as a budget, as important as the questions that surround tenure, as important as the questions that surround the daily rhythms of an institution. So, well, when we think about what has happened, there has been this rise of white liberals who have benefited greatly from Dr. King's efforts and those around him who have now become the spokespersons, whether they're speaking in a verbal form or not, and definitely non-verbally with the way they control the purse straps, with the way they control the narrative of Dr. King. So first of all, we need to make sure that those groups of what I call social justice racists are at the table when we have these conversations, but they have a way of kind of avoiding these conversations. They don't do it in public and they continue to move as usual. Well, you know, we always taught that out of the darkness comes the light. So whatever it is that you're doing, particularly the stance that you take, it'll eventually become, you know, knowledge. 
But I do believe that the cycle has to be broken, particularly when it comes to how this story is told. And by the time you get to higher ed, it's only concretized further and expanded. But what needs to happen is needs to be taken over by those who are equipped, those who are unafraid, those who are empirically correct about this topic. So I say to myself, that's why I had this topic tonight, Dr. Williams, Dr. J, my dear brother. That's why I brought it up tonight in front of the University of Wyoming, using wire as a conduit, using wire as a connector, using wire as one that thinks in many ways through the humanities, because it's more than apropos that the Black Study Center does it, but we need to have allies. Now, we're going to talk about allies in a different way, but absolutely, it needs to be restructured. So that's why I, I use this time to point directly at MLK DOD, because they have gotten away with it so long without anyone saying anything. So the time is up tonight. It's been exposed. And for those who are a part of it, feel free to have a public forum about it. That probably won't happen. But if you do choose to, don't forget me. Count me in. And we have another uh, question from the young scholar Tanner. Is there a way to retrieve these two pieces of Reverend Dr. King's MLK? Should we try to? Um, I'm not sure what you mean, Tanner, but you know you can contact me directly. So don't, don't fret. Do you think Gandhi's influence is a useful way for understanding King's increasing, increasingly radicalism? Also, do you see parallels with Gandhi's legacy and King's legacy? I absolutely see a parallel. Dr. King absorbed and internalized Gandhi's methods. Absolutely. Um, I find it very interesting, though, to talk about Dr. King, as you say, and I thank you for bringing it up, without the influence of Gandhi. Absolutely. But I, I do believe that he influenced him. But I believe that Dr. King, in his brilliance, understood that what happened in India wouldn't be as effective for the black man, woman, and child in America. So he had to partition that out. Take the best and leave the rest, if you will. And think about it in that manner. I think we got stuff in the chat there, Ken. What we got in the chat there? <clears throat> uh, the last one said there's something about the talk was excellent and, and, a, and a request for you to write a journal article to a certain journal. I'll leave that. I copied that. I'll get that to you later. Okay. Um, somebody said if uh, MLK was a big proponent as a leader in a social movement, why do you think the assassination did not strengthen that massive commitment to the, Mosul, the social movement rather than being a seminal event to the decline? Well, so, I use it as a seminal event to decline, not discussing and not having time to discuss the rise of Black power. Social movements don't last long. Dr. King shows up 1955, 13 years <clears throat> later. When have we seen a social movement last 13 years? So when we think about the question that was raised, to think about not strengthening the civil rights movement, you have to understand that the Black Power Movement was a natural outgrowth of civil rights. 1964's legislation, 1965's legislature, groundbreaking legislation. Only for the, for the majority of Blacks, particularly those that were considered and placed in the position of the permanent underclass, what it did was it sparked the ever increasing understanding of the hypocrisy of what the difference between de jure and de facto. That means of the law and of your daily life, of your daily rhythms. Yeah, it was okay that you voted, but then you look about in 1965, you think about what was going on in Mississippi. When you think about Sunflower County, Fannie Lou Hamer, less than 2% of Blacks were eligible to vote. So what's the use in having a Voters' Rights Act when you can't register to vote? So it increasingly pointed the view of and at the ruling regime. So Dr. King by this time has gone through a myriad of trials. And Dr. King says it in the book, Why We Can't Wait. He talks about it in the book, um, Chaos of Community. Where do we go from here? Chaos of Community. That he understands Black power. He just doesn't like the term because he thinks it's divisive. But he points out he understands his origin was the transatlantic slave trade, the atrocities of the transatlantic slave trade. So if you read Dr. King, if you listen to Dr. King, he's going against exactly what they told him would save his life, that he wouldn't become radical, that he would remain obedient. That's not Dr. King. He was ever increased in growing radical, more radical with the Poor People's Campaign and Tent City to go to Washington, D.C. and stay 
So if you understand that about Dr. King, then you can't paint him as a dreamer. But what works best for America's status quo? That he's fluffy, that he's lovely, that he's some sort of dreamer. No, we are going to stop the buck here tonight if nowhere else around the world. That is a done deal. And for all of you who continue to stick up for that philosophy, then that is a part of the past which means it shows exactly where you land on the idea of social justice. For the most part, it puts you in a position, particularly if you have power or whatever that power means to you as a social justice racist. But this is indeed one of those times that we will remember that we discussed Dr. King outside of the mainstream narrative. Fred, a question from Cliff. Uh, which I think fits right into what you're saying right now. You can read it, but I'll read it out loud. Is it useful to think of the continuous murder of black men today, George Floyd comes to mind, as a continuous continuation of the notorious murders of Dr. King and Medgar Evers and the like? Absolutely. Great question. And I answered it again. Absolutely. We have grown accustomed since, let's say, one, one point, one point of reference, one date. That would be January 1st, 1863, the Emancipation Proclamation. When we begin to think about that, that transfers over 4 million bodies status from slave to free. And since that time, we have seen numerous ways of dealing with what we know as the Negro question. Let me read the Negro question to you. What should be done with the presence of the troublesome Negro for maximum exploitation? Let me read it again. Now, this is from the top of the head, which means I got it right because I'm empirically correct about it. <laughs> what should be done with the presence of the troublesome Negro for maximum exploitation? Well, we understand that I think it was goal number three of the Cointel Pro, especially the youth, young black men, now more so young black women included into that equation. So yes, it has been, and it's uh, as American as apple pie, baseball and Chevrolet, that the way that the white masses respond to blacks when there's perceived or practical advance is very vital. The rise of the Ku Klux Klan, 1866, as what? On the heels of what? The Civil War. Mr. Crow, Mr. Lester, Mr. Kennedy, Mr. Reed, Mr. McCord, Mr. Jones, six original founding members, Pulaski, Tennessee. Yeah, how can we keep them terrified and oppressed since we can't call them slaves anymore. How can we return them back to slavery and a system of slavery without using the word slavery? Yep. 14th right Amendment on. talks about that. Right on. No slavery, no work unless you're what? Co convicted of a crime. Michelle Alexander talks about it in her book, The New Jim Crow. Very good book to understand. <laughs> Very good book to read. She wrote a great book. Uh, I'll let you take a look at the last one that's in there, or one of the last ones in there right now, uh, from Bradley Redder. Okay, interesting question, but I'll let you parse it. Where is it? Uh, I'll, I'll, I teach letter from a Birmingham jail in okay. Introduction to Philosophy. How do I avoid legacy assassination? It's hard to present the whole context as you have here. Well. First of all, um, to teach that in your class is indeed stepping outside of the mainstream narrative. So we give you credit for that. But to understand Dr. King and what he's doing in that particular letter, in that particular communique, he is giving a critique of many things, the church, he's giving a critique of those in the clergy, but he's given a scathing critique of white liberalism. Now, I'm not sure if that's the way you teach it, but I can't see how a wise erudite man like you could get around it if you're reading it in a critical manner. So you have to be willing to be able to give a critique of white middle-class trappings. You have to be able to give a critique. Perhaps that would be giving a critique of yourself because Dr. King gives a critique of himself when he talks about the clergy in the letter from a Birmingham jail. 
So one thing we can't teach is fortitude. We cannot teach fortitude. We can teach techniques and strategies, but how important is it to you to teach it in a way that will allow for you to, well, let me think about it this way. Um, Lerone Bennett says, in a system of oppression, an educator is either an oppressor or a revolutionary. Let me say that again, in a system of oppression, an educator is either an oppressor or a revolutionary. So I think that's pretty much a good way and a good lens to look at it, to give yourself some self-reflection. What do you believe that you are? And then what does that entail? But I would love to discuss that with you. So uh, uh, Ken, is any, well, I can put my, uh, I'll put my, I'll put my. Yeah, the chat gets re gets uh, retained so we can follow up with that. I'll put my, I'll put my your email in there. My email. Thank you. Mm -hmm. In the chat. The name is Fred. Fred. Fred Dixon. That's the name you're looking for. Frederick Douglass. You can't forget that. <laughs> Frederick Douglass I said. I sure cannot. <laughs> Frederick Douglass said, "What to the slave is the Fourth of July." Well, I give you a really quick and concise answer. What to the chicken is the fox. <laughs> I know. I see Fred Dixon. I think of this. I think of. You know, I don't quite see Maybe the same image. folks on this particular call that would be able to back that up. You just don't believe it. <laughs> you just don't believe it. So to think about having this time tonight to have this serious conversation, I want to thank Wyatt, who I believe in, who I, if you will, I, that's a partner in these kind of conversations. We really do want to look at Hopefully our guy, uh, Scott is doing a lot better and we wish him. Hey, so just to clarify, he's doing poorly because he got a shot in the arm, not for any other reasons. He'll be fine okay. in a couple of days, okay. <clears throat> just in case people are worried about that. Um, I'll wrap up perhaps if that's okay, Fred, by just saying that I've been working with you this past year um, and we've been uh, having a lot of great conversations over the year, uh, over many topics and many of them this, this past few months have been relating to the black history. As a Canadian lad, I learned a lot about the history of this country thanks to you, dear brother. And tonight was just an incredible way to end the semester on this topic. I am going to make sure lots of people get to see this video, whether they want to or not, <laughs> they're going to see it. This is amazing, Fred. And thank you so much for being you and being uh, who you are and uh, what you're sharing with us tonight. Fantastic powerful, gutsy. I love you, brother. Thank you so much, Ken. I really appreciate the kind words and I appreciate working with you. These are the things that allow for, if you will, building a new world to become part of the mainstream narrative was coming whether we like it or not. Thank you for the kind words, Ken. I appreciate it. So thank you all who are here tonight. And uh, as I said earlier, the, the questions in the Q&A get recorded and saved so Fred and I can follow up and stuff after the fact. Uh, this has been a blessing to be here this evening with you and with Fred and uh, have a good evening everybody.